First speaker is Professor Margaret Barry, who's the head of the World Health Organization Collaborating Centre in the Health Promotion Area here in NUI Galway. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Anne. Um, as Anne said, um, I head up a World Health Organization Collaborating Centre, and I can speak with some conviction about the value of interdisciplinary research for health, and also about the value of working with partners from other countries uh, and in the European context. I've participated in 10 EU health actions, uh, well, funded programmes, I should say, uh, and I have coordinated two of those, and I'm going to focus on one for the talk here this afternoon. But first, just to say something about interdisciplinary research. Uh, coming from health promotion, just to say from the outset, it's by definition multidisciplinary, and that it evolved globally as an innovative multidisciplinary approach to population health and well-being under the auspices of the WHO in the 1980s. So it was the bringing together of different per uh, disciplinary perspectives that really was responsible for the origins of health promotion. And I think the value is that when we get um, different disciplines actually working together, not just side by side, but integrated and actually leading to a creative synthesis, it's then that we can see new concepts emerging, new ways of conceptualizing what the problem, what the issue is, uh, new analytical methods and new approaches, and that take you far beyond traditional disciplinary boundaries and lead to new uh, health research paradigms. So there's great value in that. It brings a fresh perspective on old problems and challenges, uh, resulting in innovative solutions. And so, for example, using the example of health promotion, the issue is how do you improve population health? And despite a lot of advances in terms of diagnosis and treatment, um, health problems continue to be on the rise. Increases in non-communicable diseases, infectious diseases, new and emerging diseases. And so the bringing together of dis different disciplines thought, well, let's reframe that question. How can we focus on the health end of the spectrum? How can we keep people healthy? and prevent disease. We, we need, of course, to identify and treat, but we also need to look at that. So it reframed the population health challenge by asking, where is health created? And it's created in the environments where we live our lives. So we need to have a focus on the factors that influence that. So alongside the traditional biomedical model, then came perspectives from social science, which looked at uh, lifestyle factors, uh, risk be, uh, health behaviours and the extent to which they contribute to um, the onset of disease and ill health. And then it also environmental science said you've got to look at people in context. Is the environment in which we're living supportive of good health? And if not, then how can that be changed? And then finally there was perspectives from political science which said we need to look at uh, policy mechanisms for improving health and political strategies that will support the macro level and make that more health promoting. So it was the bringing together of those disciplinary perspectives that resulted in, in, in that sort of, you know, reframing of population health and well-being and a, a new set of strategies, a new set of players and intersectoral actions to, to address that. And of course, that field is still open very much to new input from new areas that will bring perspective. So I think that that shared understanding that comes from integrating different uh, disciplinary perspectives, it brings a broader and a deeper understanding than any one discipline on its own can offer. Uh, be that in terms of understanding complex causal pathways, you know, looking at, if you want to look at the causes of illness, but then also looking at the causes of the causes. Uh, looking at designing and evaluating complex interventions. Uh, and translating research and evidence into action. So for all of those areas, interdisciplinarity is really important. I think interdisciplinary research also recognizes the value of non-academic partners, recognizing that there are different types of knowledge. Uh, I know as academics, we value scientific knowledge, but there are equally valid types of knowledge that need to be taken into account, particularly when we are uh, creating knowledge for policy and practice-based decision-making, which will lead to solutions. Okay, so the project that I coordinated uh, from 2009 to 2002 was known as COMP, and it was funded under the, um, the health program of the European Union. Um, and given that health promotion was multidisciplinary, the challenge here was to develop a shared vision for health promotion capacity building in Europe. 
uh, and doing that through establishing what are core competencies for action here, professional standards and quality assurance with regard to the education and training and the practice of health promotion. So in other words, laying down a, a, a sort of a, a shared vision about what this area should deliver on as a new multidisciplinary area. We had 24 project partners, but we had eight core partners. So the eight core partners were those who had were responsible for work packages, held budgets, and delivered. And then the others were collaborative partners that were really important in terms of bringing in perspectives from the different regions of Europe, because health promotion was at different stages of development. And we needed to have a consensus building approach, um, which would really lead to a framework that was robust but yet sensitive to the differences across the diverse countries. So that was quite you know, a challenge in the project. And I'm going to focus on the process elements because I know you're all not as interested in health promotion as I am. <laughs> but but I'm, I'm, usually we focus on is the science and the methodology good? But I think everyone here, this, this, all the speakers this morning said you really do need to focus on the process as well, how you're going to manage this and deliver. So I'm just going to pull out a couple of key points from this project. Um, the first one there I think is really, really important is to have a strategic vision in terms of where is this going, why are you doing it, what's the long-term impact. And very importantly, it should be shared. It's not enough for the coordinator to have that. The core partners need to really buy into that and to own that kind of shared vision of what this whole project is about. Um, good coordination and management of the overall project is vital. Um, keeping things on track, making sure it's everybody's delivering. That's really, really critical and not to be underestimated. Likewise, having a good work plan from the outset and sticking to that work plan. Um, the talk there about robust methodological approach with good communication, you know, clear timelines, and people being very clear about their roles in relation to that, that there's a coherence across the work package and everybody knows where they, where they fit in. I, I think the process needs to be very high quality, as does the products, because if the quality is not good, well then, you know, it, it may not be worth doing. Um, and getting engagement of key stakeholders from outside the project, I think it's important not to wait until towards the end, but right from the beginning to think about where will the ultimate impact of this be, who, who, how are you going to mobilise action after the project to ensure that what you've done gets taken up and embedded. So I think that that is, you know, timing is really important, ensuring relevance uh, in really, and just generating interest right from day one. So I think that these are really important aspects of the process that need to be taken into account. So in terms of some of the kind of lessons uh, on reflecting on it, I've said about the strategic vision and the coordination, because one without the other is no good. A good vision without coordination is not going anywhere. Coordination without a vision is, is, is worthless. So that's really important. I think motivating partners towards a sense of commitment and ownership, you really have to work on that, uh, and preferably at the stage of proposal writing, but I think all the way through, and that was mentioned by a number of speakers this morning, using the time in meetings to build up relationships, to establish trust, particularly when you're working across disciplines, it's really, really important. Um, Having, I think, uh, tangible outcomes and results in early phases of the work. Again, that's really, you know, that it's important both for the internal uh, sort of motivation, but also for the external reputation that you are delivering on concrete elements of the proposal quite early on, because people can see, ah, well, this is, it's, it's, it, this is where it's going, this is what it's doing, and it can do it, and we can do more. So I think that that's actually, to build that into the proposal is quite important. <clears throat> the next point I think is hugely important, and that is valuing diversity in disciplines and cultures. And I think uh, valuing diversity in disciplines is really important uh, in terms of different disciplinary perspectives, Okay, they have different ways of looking thing, at things, they have different methods, but also they have different cultures of working. And sometimes I think we underestimate this. Uh, so there's a different approach from different disciplines, and it's only when you start really working very closely together that you realize that. Sometimes it's implicit, but it can actually be a, you know, a, a major issue if, if you're not aware of it. And then also valuing different cultures, even within Europe, working with colleagues across Europe, there are different um, cultural expectations 
uh, down to even how meetings are managed, how much time people are given to speak, um, the richness of diverse perspectives. That's a strength of European projects, and that really has to be developed. So I think that's crucially important. And being open, I think having an attitude of open-mindedness in terms of valuable input. And then aiming at real participation uh, based on consultation and collaborative working. Uh, and that is really letting people engage. So I think if you, you know, I was looking at this and all of the projects I've been involved with inside or outside EU, th these are important and they're really critical and I think they still hold. So thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. Um, similar to this morning, we're going to go through the speakers and have um, questions and answers at the end. I'd like to invite our second speaker, Dr. Mark. Tully. Mark is with us from the School of Medicine, Dentistry and Biomedical Science uh, and the Centre for Public Health from Queen's University Belfast. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so it's a real pleasure uh, to be with you this afternoon for the faithful few, uh, as they say. Um, so when was the last time you watched TV standing up? Or when was the last time in your desk at work you just decided to read that document standing up? The plague of modern life is the chair. Uh, and so in our Horizon 2020 grant, what we've tried to do is to think, how can we encourage healthy active ageing uh, and get away from the demon chair? Um, we are partners in a consortium uh, in a Horizon 2020 grant on a project called SITLUS, which uh, really originated in the sense that how could we move current uh, services to promote physical activity uh, that are sort of common across uh, many European countries, such as exercise referral, uh, more uh, taking lessons from behavioural science and self-management strategies, uh, and thinking the novelty of thinking of where people are at, not where we want them to be. So many of our clients uh, aren't in our gyms exercising. They're sitting at home watching Coronation Street uh, and EastEnders. And so starting where people are at and getting to move about their homes a bit more, and then adding on the functional and fitness benefits of being part of an exercise referral scheme. Uh, so you owe me a bit of standing at some point uh, later today. Just try it. It's actually quite good fun. You get lots of strange people looking at you. Um, so our, our, our network uh, runs across a number of European countries. And, and what I've tried to do is to distill some of the lessons we've learned uh, along the way. Um, so uh, the first thing that um, our my mentor and our professor said to me was that the way into European funding is through existing networks. Uh, and I don't, don't get downheartened by that one, because if you don't have an existing network, it can be a bit challenging. But uh, money attracts money, and people who have applied for successful grants before seem to know the tips and tricks that are hard to, um, to draw out in a talk, uh, but they seem to have models previously before. So uh, we were invited through an existing FP7 network to develop um, a, a grant. Uh, we utilised uh, funding within our own university for travel, uh, and I was following the Twitter feed earlier. Uh, I wasn't able to be here for, for some of the morning, and I noticed somebody else picked up on this one as well about the limitations of Skype and video conferencing uh, and the importance of getting out and seeing. And so uh, really what we did early on was to, was to leave Belfast, imagine it, uh, and travel out to our European partners uh, to actually show our willingness to collaborate by visiting them. At and it's hard to say no, um, spending a week in Barcelona in July. Um, so we partnered with a number of, uh, of partners. Now, how, how were they selected? They were selected because they were previously successful in related grants, partly and partly for their methodological expertise. Uh, so really what we did was we looked for people who had success either within FP7 previously or uh, had the methodological expertise in similar projects to put together uh, the team. Um, our process, and everybody has a slightly different way, uh, at the time we were started chatting, there was a number of calls uh, that we could have got into. So what we did was we, we were working in uh, aging and healthy active aging, and we thought, well, what are, what's the actual needs in healthy active aging, and how would that best then apply to the right call? Um, some people will start with a call and de develop a project. That's kind of what the exercise went through earlier. But we went with the gaps, the, the needs analysis, and, and then decided we'd wait for the right project uh, to come along, uh, the right call to come along. Uh, and um, methodol uh, novelty was one of the things that we were trying to seek for. So not trying to answer the question uh, in the way we tried before, but really to stretch uh, the science a bit forward. And, and really we were trying to push forward, particularly on the sedentary behavior um, science, uh, which was really in its infancy at the time we put our, our call in. 
Um, one, of the, one of the risks in putting together a new call is that you compromise sometimes on methodological quality because if you're like me, you're kind of trying to put together proposals maybe towards the end of the deadline process. And you kind of go, well, it'll do. Uh, and what we said earlier on was that nothing will just do and that we wouldn't compromise at any point on methodological quality. Uh, and I think that held uh, true for us. Um, and the other aspect of that, that we, we were keen that we would have a very direct uh, route to impact. Um, many of us have written impact statements and the like before, and they're usually a bit um, uh, loose in their uh, real route to impact. Uh, and so we were trying to think of how would he commercialize this, pro this program? Who would be the users or the purchasers of a program like this? So tips and advice, well, I always prefer to say what worked for us. It may not work for you, but it certainly seemed to work. One of the things we did early on was to approach uh, a panel member, um, not on the panel we were going to, but on panels, uh, and ask them specific questions. Should we do X or Y? And that was very helpful. They, they weren't an expert in our area, but they were really able to guide us as to what the right decisions were, uh, and it gave us some independent advice on that. We, we set, a, set aside to define and conquer the task, so my personal interest is in developing interventions, so I wrote up that. Someone else was more interested in route to impact and dissemination, uh, and they took on that. So as opposed to one partner trying to write everything, uh, we said who has expertise in the sections, uh, and they led that. Um, we, in, in our center, have coordinated a number of FP7 grants, uh, but there was one of our colleagues in Barcelona who had successfully administered a number of, uh, of FP7 grants uh, and were keen to take on the administration. So really it's finding someone who has that expertise in the administration of European funding. Uh, and the other thing we wanted to do was to be extremely explicit about A, our ability to deliver on a project like this. So we were very clear and cherry-picked the projects we reported to say we can do this because we've done it before under these various other projects. And then alongside that, uh, we can push forward the science because we push forward the science in, in, in these number of areas. So we're very explicit in showing both our expertise in delivery and our expertise in methodology. Uh, and finally, and, and this was the bit that I was most interested and excited about and has really helped, was finding an organization who specialized in, um, in, in delivery and commercialization of programs. So I don't know if you know Seal Blue, but they're a not-for-profit French organization who do a lot around uh, healthy active aging uh, and develop, have developed a number of uh, programs. Uh, and they partnered up and are leading a, a, a working group in it uh, around developing a business plan. Um, we're a year in of a four and a half year project and we've already written the business plan and all we need to do now is put in the figures uh, around the cost effectiveness and that. So it's about getting started on that early uh, uh, and having partners with a track record in delivery on that. So in summary, um, I was thinking what I would finish on and I think the, finish, the thing I'd finish on is don't enter uh, these kinds of grants lightly. Um, but most of us are uh, apathetic by nature and kind of go, well, it looks too hard for me. Um, so stop sitting on your hands and start reading these things. In other words, sit less, write more. Thank you very much. Um, our fourth speaker this afternoon is Professor Dimple Casey from the School of Nursing and Midwifery in Anyone Galway. sure you're all exhausted and at, at this stage. So I'm going to talk about the slides a bit like uh, Professor Tim O'Brien said this morning. The slides are in the format that we were given and I didn't have the chance, like I have a pandy had to actually change them and, and jizz them up a bit. But um, it's just reinforcing, I guess, some of the ideas that people um, and, and the advice that people have actually given um, already today. Um, Okay. Basically, okay, an overview um, okay, of the research projects to date. And this really might be helpful for early stage researchers because my first project that I got funded was from the Millennium Grant Scheme here in, in UI Galway. And I was so delighted it was only for 2,000 euro, but gosh, you could have given me a prize bond, I was so happy. That was the start. And that's how you can see the progression from there, in terms of there were bigger Millennium Funding fu grants that I got. And then, I suppose, um, in 2000, 
and five, the Daphne project, which Mary Louise and Molly were involved in as well. And that was looking at dose adjustment for normal eating for people with type 1 diabetes. And that was my first, if you like, foray as a co-applicant into a major grant. And that grant was led by Professor Sean Dineen. And the value of the grant was a uh, million, uh, one million euro. Then we had the DARES HRB project, which was led by um, uh, Professor Raymond O'Shea, and was led within the school by C Professor Cathy Murphy and um, myself. And that basically, lo basically looked at, again, looking at chronic illness. It looked at dementia programs with reminiscence for people with, um, living in long stay care to see would it impact on their quality of life. Then we had the Prince study, and you can see I'm suddenly moving up. I'm gone from being a nobody to a co-PI. And this was my first foray, really, into leading a project. Again, this was an RCT, and it looked at um, a structured education program for people with COPD, improving their quality of life. So you can see the train here that is coming. It's all to do with chronic disease and self-management. And currently, we're just about to start a Crest HRB study, which is looking at dementia and how to build resilience in people with dementia. And the one that we're leading at the moment, or that I'm leading at the moment, is the Mario project. And that's a Horizon 2020 bid. Um, and really, it looks at addressing loneliness and isolation for older people with dementia. Um, we've got 10 partners from six countries, three pilot sites. The duration is three years. We're just coming up to the 18-month review, just about to submit it at the end of September, um, and panicking, trying to put it together. And it's worth 4 million euro. This is a picture. Mario arrived last week at the pilot sites. Great excitement. He happened to get lost on the way. Um, when he, he was supposed to go to one of the nursing homes down in the, uh, the Loch Ray region. And, um, for some reason, the couriers decided that he was going to go to Carlo instead. So he arrived in Carlo. The staff in Carlo actually signed for the box, and off they went. And when they opened the box, I'd love to have seen their faces when they saw not a fridge, but a robot. So then we had the wonderful scenario of trying to get him out of Carlo, back down to Loch Ray in Roscommon. And the couriers went back. They collected him. and. Uh, then they subsequently rang us the night after to say the next day, uh, we've lost him. He's got lost in the warehouse. We can't find him. Now, we had visions. I'll show you a little clip in a minute of him. We had visions of Mario popping out of the box and taking a tour around, around the warehouse. Because how is this possible? You know, he, he's not really charged up to go, but clearly he's decided he's wiring himself up and he's taking off. So finally, the next morning, they went, it's OK, we found him. He's here. We have him. And they eventually delivered him to the site. There was some few pieces missing, but at least we got him to where, where he was. So great excitement. And the photograph here with the number of people together is at the pilot site with staff, introducing them to, to Mario. And the whole point of Mario is that he's a social companion for people with dementia, because one of the main problems people with dementia suffer with is actually loneliness and isolation, and they become more and more withdrawn. So that's his whole purpose in life, is actually to be a social companion. And I need to get out of this to... How do I escape? Oh, yeah. Bear with me, I'm half blind, drop my glasses. I'll probably never be able to get the slides back again. This is what he looks like.
Okay, so we were, we were very glad to see him soon when we did find him. And just to... Uh, help! Oh no, I might be able to find it here. One second, I might be able to find it. I wanted to just mm -hmm. show them the... Is, he, is this my one? It's not that sure one yet. No, or is there is that It's one? intense. Yeah. It, that, no, that's that one that you okay. put in. Yeah. Okay. It's actually near the desktop as well. No, it's it's just okay. Into the desktop. It's okay. I just want to show them this one here. Oh, great. Okay. And I just, if, as if you hadn't enough, this is just to show you some of the. Oh. It's not actually working. Okay. I only downloaded it from the internet a few minutes ago, and it was just to show you some of the preliminary work that was done with Mario, and it shows Mario dancing to music. And it's actually a little nice little clip, but unfortunately, it's not. Um, I didn't have enough time to actually get it down correctly, so I apologize to that, for that. So just go back into the presentation and stick to what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> OK. Right, OK. Tips re-maximizing opportunities for interdisciplinary research. Look, I won't bore you. Everything that's up here has already been said this morning in terms of how you build your networks, really important. And down on the right-hand side, or this is the left-hand side that you look at, what I did. So really identifying the key area, which was older people, chronic disease, self-management, joining a local network. In this case, we couldn't find one, so we set it up ourselves, the Galway Dementia Network. Um, and being part of the Population Health Research and Health Services Research Network, which was really important, and that's chaired by um, Professor Andrew Murphy. And that was really, again, giving ideas, discussing it. That's an interdisciplinary group, and it's really good in terms of seeing cross-fertilization across the ideas that people may have uh, and going forward from there. Linking with colleagues, joining international network. We joined Interdem, which is a dementia pan-European uh, international group, and they've been fantastic. And through working with them, we've got involved in, in putting in other bids. As, as, as everybody has said, the number of bids that you put in that you don't get a success for are quite a lot, but they're never wasted. You actually build them and, and keep putting them back in or putting them in under another guise. So they're never wasted. And the NUIG Research Office events, focusing on sp specific bids and health bids, again, looking at those to see where we might fit in. Um, Planning well in advance, knowing who your national contact person is. And really, hard work and patience, it takes, it takes a lot of time. I mean, I absolutely am passionate about Mario and what he's going to do for dementia, because I really think he can make a difference. If you told me 10 years ago I'd be standing here talking to you about robots and technology, I'd have laughed you out of it, because I'd say, there's no way on earth I'd be standing up here, because I hardly know one end of the computer from another end of the computer. And when somebody talked to me initially about the notion of robots, in my head it was Star Trek and R2-D2 and you know, Seven of Nine and all of this, and thinking, this is what I expected, and discovered the reality is quite different and quite limited in what we can do. And I have a little slide here, I think you might be able to see, that says, there's a lot to do in terms of look as well. Actually having the right idea and being at the right place at the right time does happen. In terms of how Mario evolved, um, and Adam Kampis, who spoke earlier today from Passau in, in Germany, was at the time, somebody had said, why not invite the Insight Technology Group to our Galway Dementia meeting? And I said, well, technology, you know, I don't know if they'll fit in here, what do we do? So we did, we invited uh, Adam Mantis, and he actually came to the meeting. And at that meeting, we had just put in a HRB grant that we had just uh, bid, that we had just completed. And it was looking at building resilience and reducing loneliness and isolation for people with dementia. And we have a small little piece about technology in it, really small, purely because in the phone call, it said something about technology, that we shoved something in. But really, we didn't know what the capacity would be for it. And Adam Mantis had the vision to see, do you know what? Actually, if you put that in for an ICT call, and if you worked it up in a different way, it might actually get funded. 
I would never have thought of looking under an ICT card because health was all I would have been focusing on. And I initially thought, oh, this, you know, <laughs> this ain't going to work. But actually, let's have a go and had a chance. And that's what we did. And lo and behold, we got it funding. We got it fu I mean, it was, you know, we were. So there is an element of being in the right place at the right time, having something that you can work on. But you do have the work done. You know what I mean? It, it is not that you don't do the work, but it's sometimes you don't see where the right opportunity might be. And that's why having somebody exper <coughs> excuse me, as experienced as Adamantus, somebody who can mentor you and show you those kind of gaps that you wouldn't see, in my, in my experience, anyway, was really, really important. And really, it's, you know, has, has helped us to get um, where we are. And from being involved in Mario, loads of other opportunities have, have come up on the way. Um, I have to say, and I'll be very honest, coordinating the bid isn't my great joy in life, but I love the research side. And I love that it's going to make a difference to people. But it is a challenge to coordinate it. I'd be lying to you if it wasn't. You've got cross-cultural issues. You've got people who have different languages, different agendas. It's a bit like you know, Henry Kissinger trying to pull everybody together to work and keep going at the end of the agenda to get to the end point. One thing that keeps me going is that this can really make a difference for people with dementia. So all I would say is hang in there, keep plugging away. It does actually get to success in the end. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. I'm smiling at your, your own perception that robots were like R2-D2 or something, because I had had a lot of conversations with our legal team around whether Mario classified as a medical device or not. And certainly, he's much bigger than it was in my head. I, that's not the image I had of Mario. Don't change your mind. It's okay. a medical device. <laughs> Um, thank you, Dimna. The final speaker we have this evening is Dr. Liam, Liam Glynn from our School of Medicine. Um, thanks very much. Um, I, I was absolutely assuming that everybody would have said everything worth saying at this point uh, being the last speaker of the day. So I, I'm definitely going to go on a tangent and I'm going to completely ignore the instructions I was giving in, in, in terms of this presentation. So you'll have to bear with me on that. But I, I will just start by reiterating a couple of points. I, I'm a GP actually, um, ma mainly, that's, that's mainly what I do. Um, and. Um, I, I suppose the points I'd like to reiterate are definitely the, the point about networks. I think it's been brought up again and again. Um, my network is basically my primary care team where I work. We look after about 8,000 people um, in North Clare. A lot of elderly, a lot of chronic disease has been mentioned already. Um, and I suppose the bigger network that I was involved in setting up was the West End network, which is 200, 000, uh, sorry, 200 practices up in, from Donegal to, to Cork, covering about a million patients. Um, that's all very well. You know, th these are important, but I suppose one of the, the things I'd like to reiterate or iterate is the fact that you've got to build them first of all, but then you have to look after them. And there's a huge amount of work often in, in, involved in that, and sometimes it's successful and sometimes it's not. Um, so it's, it's worth bearing in mind the cost benefit associated with, uh, with, with the, uh, the sustainability around networks. Um, I suppose one of the important things I think you have to do earlier on is you have to know your strengths. And, and certainly from my point of view as a clinician, that was definitely um, access to patients, I think. I mean, that's what a lot of consortia were looking for. They said, look, we have a great idea, we have a great intervention, we need to test it. And, and we were the access point for that. So, so, so you need to think about what your own strengths are. Um, for us, it was through, obviously, the primary care team initially, definitely the Western network. And, and as time went on, and, and this became more, uh, we wanted to formalize this more, we then went directly to individuals who f we felt might be interested in research and offered to bring them into what we've called Home Lab. This is something we developed in conjunction with Georgia Tech, where we basically have um, um, many individuals with different diseases sitting in the community who want to get involved in research and want to be involved with testing devices and testing interventions, and they're ready to go, as it were. So that was, a, that was another sort of step forward. I suppose the other thing we need to recognize is the other thing we're bringing to the table is methodological expertise um, um, around qualitative and quantitative. And to have that mix of expertise, as I'll allude to later, I think is really important. Um, and fundamentally, our ability to run large-scale primary care trials was another really attractive point. You then develop a track record, and that not, it becomes another selling point in, in terms of um, your, your series of strengths. 
I think it's been said around, you know, you got to surround yourself with good people and people you want to work with. And I think that counts for mentors, but also a peer group. I, I was really lucky to get accepted onto um, the, what, what was initially called the Brisbane Initiative, which is uh, the Oxford International Primary Care Research Leadership Program. And that provided me with a peer group through that um, program, which lasted for two years. But then our cohort has kept together in terms of being a, a support group, a, a, a group that, you know, having really high level researchers around Europe who you can tap into um, as that sort of resource, I think, is, is really important as well. And I'd encourage anybody to get involved in this because it's truly interdisciplinary um, if you get the opportunity. When you do hang out with really good people, um, you realize that, you know, you know, what we do is so often is not linear. Um, so I suppose being too fixed, and I, I think as Dimfin was alluding to, you know, stuff comes along the whole time. And I think if your inclination is to say yes more often than you say no, then opportunities will present themselves. So I think I th that was a really interesting lesson for me earlier on. Um, these are some of the EU-funded projects um, I've been involved in. Um, I, I wanted to mention, just to highlight a couple of them, um, the first one came was a, a two and a half million um, euro project, which was funded through um, what used to be MPP, the Northern Periphery Program, is now NPA um, because everybody's uh, got excited about the Arctic region. But essentially, we're, we're in, in, in Galway, we're unique, and we're one of the few universities on the island um, who have access to this funding stream. And it isn't as competitive as the main funding streams like, like um, FP7 and H2020. Um, so it's something worth bearing in mind. Um, this is a really interesting um, uh, consortium and project. We had 10 different projects to deliver using connected health solutions around the delivery of healthcare. Um, and I suppose I want to just highlight, we were leading on um, running a randomized controlled trial in primary care um, around using a smartphone application to promote physical activity. Um, so obviously we, we needed to draw in loads of different expertise. So that was a real sort of learning point around this project was about trying to develop that expertise um, externally and internally, and also then using the interdisciplinary group we had to um, take advantage of the dif different methodological expertise we had, which was crucial in terms of the out outcomes of the trial. Because it's all very well getting a positive result in your OCT, um, which we, we, were, we were lucky enough to do. But what was really more important was to try and explain, like, okay, this, this, this worked, but why was it working? Um, and, and that's where the qualitative work and the qualitative expertise um, and the psych psychology input we had was, was really important. So a true interdisciplinary um, a, a approach, which allowed us to describe what, was, what we, we termed the no-check-move effect, um, which was describing what was happening between the participants and the technology and their behavior in the promotion of, of physical activity. So that was a, it was another real strength of, of that particular experience. Early on as well, we, we partnered with GOs, governmental organizations and NGOs around this because we were really, you know, and I think this is the other thing that's worth emphasizing is the importance of impact. It's been mentioned already, but unless those relationships and interest is stimulated early on, it just isn't going to happen. As a result of that project, currently we have 13 different centers around Clare where about 300 older adults come for physical activity and social um, contact classes essentially every week. So that has been a really nice spin-off and that wouldn't have happened without those um, you know, proper um, interdisciplinary relationships happening um, early on. This is, um, this is another grant I want to allude to. It was an FP7 grant. Um, and it, in many ways, it was, it was very different in rather than being lots of different projects and lots of different things going on, it really was about one thing. It was about developing a prototype. Um, and anybody who's developed prototypes know it's all about making as many mistakes as you can and learning from those mistakes as quickly as you can. Um, so it was really interesting to really delve very deeply into, into something like this. And what it does, what, it, what I really learned from this was when you go through this sort of a process and so many problems are coming at you all the time, the strength of having an interdisciplinary um, thinking and an inter interdisciplinary team involved really, really comes through in terms of, of trying to move the project on. And that really got me thinking about um, how we think and how we're trained. And I suppose I'm specifically going to allude to the, the interface between engineering and medicine, because that's probably the, the, the one I've been most uh, familiar with and most interested in. Um, firstly, because I came from a family of engineers and they, they loved um, reminding me as a doctor that the most important 
Um, the most important um, advancement in health in the last century was actually an engineering advancement, which was obviously water and sanitation rather than anything to do with medicine. So this is what I heard again and again growing up. But, but I suppose I did come to certainly value my engineering co colleagues, and I began to wonder why, and, and because it's all okay to say, right, this interdisciplinary thing is great, but why is it great? Like, wh what is it that creates the, the synergy and that synergistic effect from different disciplines coming together? Um, that really got me thinking about engineering, um, you know, engineers and clinicians or engineers and doctors. And I suppose my discovery was, um, and a lot of you would be aware of it, I, I think our training teaches us to think quite differently. On the one hand, me as a clinician, what I'm taught to do is take this very categorical approach to solving a problem, which is normally a patient in front of me that I'm trying to diagnose. So I'm, I, I try and discover the pattern of signs and symptoms, and, um, and then I try to come up with common diagnoses associated with this data set of, of signs and symptoms. Now this is great when that's a common thing like a chest infection or a urinary tract infection or a fracture. But it's not so great when you have these sort of rare or outliers um, in terms of diagnosis. So the, the, if there's computer programmers down there, you'd know this as, as what you know, programmers would call searching a known set. So it's the fastest way to find a solution if the solution's in the set, but it's the, i.e. common, but it's the slowest if the solution is out with the set. And this is where this term in medicine that we use quite a lot that you may have heard before, when we sit down to diagnose somebody, you know, we're always told, remember, common things are common. So that's your clinical sort of you know, training. The engineer, on the other hand, as I've discovered, is trained to look at a problem in the abstract and use sort of testable hypotheses to isolate the component parts of the problem and then solve them individually, if possible, in, in a very sort of logical way. So they take a known solution, and then they use that as a starting point to hypothesize a solution that applies to the problem in front of them. So I, I, I'd like to tell the story of it to try and illustrate this of, of the um, the woman who's been wooed by the engineer and the doctor. And um, every day, they'd both call up to her, her apartment and um, try and make their case. And every day, the doctor would turn up with a rose. And every day, the engineer would turn up with, a, with an apple. Um, and eventually, they, they met on the stairs on the way up to the apartment one day. And, and the doctor looked at the engineer and he says, what, what's the story with the apple? And the engineer said, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And uh, if you forgive my corny joke, I think it does, it does sort of illustrate that, you know, in terms of the doctor, the known set for him was, you know, women like flowers. So if I keep bringing her flowers, surely that's going to work. Whereas for the engineer, what was the problem? The problem was the doctor. So if you get rid of him, you're, you're on to something. Uh, but, but I suppose, it, you know, it, it was this process was really interesting for me because, you know, what it taught me was this is, you know, our different approaches create this really positive synergy. So there's a reason why this thing is important. Um, w one of the guys in the team was so successful at sort of, I suppose, blurring the boundaries between the disciplines. And I, this is what I'd encourage us all to try and do. Rather than sitting here and trying to collaborate with somebody over there, we need to really understand where they're coming from. Um, so we ended up um, calling him, he, he, he was actually an engineer by training, but he was so, became so afraid through the project with the clinic, clinical aspects of the project. To us, he was the engineer. So this was a new sort of super species that we felt we had created through this project. Anyway, um, just my, my last word to you would be this. You know, there isn't a silver bullet to this stuff. Um, and I think you've probably realized that for yourselves. Uh, maybe you came here looking for it. But ultimately, the success that you've heard about already today from lots of really interesting people, you know, there's loads of persistence, there's loads of failure, there's loads of sacrifice and disappointment. But, you know, I think with good habits, the lessons we've talked about today, hard work and dedication, you know, success can never be far away. Thank you. Um, I, I'm asking a question that was raised at one of the other workshops, but is, it was an interesting question. Is We're talking here about the inputs to a project and making the project work. But what happens at the end of the project and the outputs? Because this is where it sometimes breaks down in, in terms of the interdisciplinarity. When you're working together, do ever, does everyone just go back into their silos and publish back into their own areas again? And Abby and Valerie. Well, most EU grants will have mobility 
in, in, in Marie Curie, you would have mobility in, embedded in the proposal itself. So mobility means one researcher goes to another lab or another unit to work in. So you would, by default, get a publication which is going to be co-authors anyway. So, so we all go back to our silos by nature, as you're right. But at the same token, there are rewards that are learned by experience that people get uh, by going into other lab, by engaging for the four years. But there, you, you moved your knowledge to another space by getting that experience. Right. So, so yes, we all move to solids when the funding is ended, but then you've enriched your own yourself with what you've gained in those four years. I don't know if I'm answering the question. But. Any other questions? Molly um, asked me to try and have a few thoughts together to, to, to bring the, the whole session to a close. Um, and I'm kind of trying to pick up, I have scribbles and notes all over the place here, I've been changing my mind as the day gone on, but a lot of the themes have recurred during the day. The President this morning talked about the importance of the quality of the idea, the proposals and the partnerships, and I certainly think, you know, both within a new I Galway and within an Irish context, our size is important. Being small is actually a good thing when it comes to having the ability to get to know each other and being able to reach out and to reach out both internally within the institutions and externally um, because it is easier to, to, to connect with people. Well, I, I also, there was a lot of reference to the scoping papers, and I think when we look at the scoping papers for the various societal challenges, and we have, we have the health scoping paper, that there really is a strong emphasis on interdisciplinarity, and particularly around vertical, horizontal, and cross-cutting themes. And I think from that point of view, when, and I would appeal to all of the researchers that are here, when we get opportunities, to feed into the draft work programs and the consultation processes that it actually is important that we do so and Patricia talked about you know that you, they, they, they do listen in the commission and you know that, that this can be quite effective I think we also there was also discussion around you know the dis the definition of interdisciplinarity and you know how it is a real coming together of dis disciplines and I like Liam's um, hybrid place of clean technologists or engineers, or you know, that it really is this space between the disciplines, and um, you know, and it's not necessarily across. It's not always across the STEM, the arts, humanities, and social sciences. It can be within the STEM areas, like Liam, Liam referred to, the engineers and the medicine area as well. And it also can be included to bring in a variety of other different stakeholder types. And I think. The whole idea of, of, of that challenging people and challenging researchers and taking them out of their comfort zone is very important to consider because it really does, as Margaret alluded to, give us fresh perspectives and really can um, diversify the possibilities that will result from the research. Some of the key points that I, I, I think were raised and, and repeated at various points during the day, which really means that they are challenges that people face. I think the whole idea that the discipline-specific languages vary, so how important it is to kind of peel back the language, peel back the jargon, and peel back the boundaries so that you can really build a common language across the consortium and learn from each other. And I, from that point of view as well, I think that the, 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 the principle of you know the, the valuing the diversity and understanding where the researchers from the other disciplines come from um, is important. And really, that whole idea of enabling us to think um, differently is important. A number of the speakers uh, talked about networking and the quality of the partnerships, and it was very clear that Skype is, was not a preferred way of doing things, and that really to have very real, uh, tangible collaborations, that there is no substitution for face-to-face -face meetings, and the importance of be building trust as well. Some of the other points that were raised were, you know, to remember the end users and getting the end users involved. And I think John O'Dea had a very important point when he talked about the SMEs. And like the SMEs haven't, aren't coming to this on a strong track record. The expertise from FP7 and earlier programs is really within the institutions. And that's something that we really should um, play to our advantage. 
I think it was Tim um, that alluded to the fact that, you know, to, to know the call document, that there isn't a word there that isn't relevant, so importance of like understanding the nuances and what they're looking for within the document. And again, the importance of looking across the programmes. It was Dimpnen and a number of other speakers said that, you know, they never expected to get funding through the ICT call or they never expected to get funding through a, a health call or I've seen people get funding through security and you would think they're the last people that would get funded under a security theme. So again, it's a thing coming a little bit beyond your box, beyond your comfort zone and to seeing what other opportunities that are there. From some of the challenges um, that a number of the speakers alluded to when it came to putting together and building an interdisciplinary theme, it strikes me that the management of disciplinarity is something that's very important to consider in the development of the proposal. So that the, so that the delivery flows from a very solid foundation and it'll really only be then that we'll really come up with very novel solutions to the societal challenges that we are, we, we, we're, we're trying to address here. In terms of next steps, Stephen alluded to the fact, you know, that the importance of, of, of targeting the EI grants, the, the EI travel grants, support grants that are there. Uh, I, earlier this week, it's only la yesterday or the day before, the IRC New Horizon call has just opened, and I think that's a very important opportunity. That's there to encourage researchers in the arts, humanities, and social sciences area to collaborate with researchers in the STEM area on interdisciplinary projects that address societal challenges. So I'd encourage you all um, to look at that. And I, I also understand from Molly and Valerie that there is some money available from this program to further certain um, um, projects or collaborations or opportunity that may arise um, from the, the networking sessions earlier today. Um, Abbe also, I think uh, you had strong justification there, strong evidence there, the importance of you know, building on your failure and resubmitting and not being afraid to actually um, try again. So I think they were the main points that I got out of the day, um, and I'm sure there was a lot others as well. I want to finish by congratulating Molly, Martin, Valerie, and the whole team that were involved in Firstly, writing the, the, the proposal, the IRC funding from this was, came through a competitive process, but on a very productive and successful day today. To thank all the speakers um, that were involved in all of the sessions and all the chairs, um, to thank the IRC for its funding and support uh, and the other agencies that are represented here today as well, and to thank you for attending. <laughs>